Thank you. Okay, so this is a really exciting topic, uh, not only for your region, just because you don't formulate for the fun of it, you formulate, well, it is fun, but you also want to maximise the efficacy from every formula, but in particular, whitening products for this region, very popular, anti-pollution, again, very popular and continuing to grow uh, and expand into other areas. And sunscreens, they're always a challenge. So in this one presentation today, I'm gonna to be covering some key elements of how to maximize efficacy out of these three different product types. Uh, I'm going to first look at some of the issues when formulating um, these products and issues in the marketplace with maximising their efficacy, helping them stand out. Then I'm going to actually give you some solutions of how to make your product stand out from a marketing and uh, a formulation perspective and then how to boost efficacy for the formulations. First of all, the issues with whitening products. These are some of the key issues you'll find when marketing and formulating a whitening product. One thing to be aware of, don't overpromise um, to your consumer because you can never give a cosmetic product that's going to make them whiter than the skin they were born with. You also can't make it happen in a day unless you're giving them some sort of topical uh, or visual performance aspect, which is also a great addition to these formulas to give them an instant result. But I'm not looking at the solutions yet. I'm looking at the problems you face. Um, so just briefly, with the whole reaction, it all starts from UV exposure, okay? And it's really uh, a, a natural mechanism by the body to protect us from sun exposure. So it starts with UV radiation, um, and this sets off um, a reactive event uh, that we then produce alpha MSH uh, that alpha MSH then binds to the cell. This then in turn activates your tyrosinase. That activates tyrosine to turn to dopa, turn to dopaquinone. This then activates colour in the cells. It binds to keratinocytes and you eventually get colour coming out. So it seems logical that if we stopped the UV exposure in the first place, you're going to get better results. Okay, And that's in fact one of the solutions to help maximise efficacy from these products because there's no point selling these products to a consumer that doesn't realise that that incidental sun exposure is going to defeat the purpose. Do you know what I mean? So it's great when you have dual products, day products and night products for whitening efficacy. Um, the day product should have some sort of SPF protection because you can't change a consumer's habits. But if you can put a material in there, like a UV absorber that stops the UV reaction in the first place, they're going to get better results. Okay, you get an active in there that's actually going to help uh, inhibit, where's my little pointer? Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Okay, I'm just gonna have to point. You can stop the reaction at the start by inhibiting UV. You can get some actives that actually inhibit the tyrosinase process. You can get actives that help stop the transfer to keratinocytes. But even if you had the best active, and let's face it, there's a lot out there to choose from. If you don't put them in a good formulation base, you're not gonna get the active to where it needs to go. So one of your main issues when formulating a whitening product is you need to get it to the basal layer of the epidermis it needs to be where it needs to act, otherwise you're not gonna get the performance. Um, you also need to look at actives specific to the skin type you're formulating for. And you wanna see in vivo results in that skin type. What am I talking about here? I'm talking specifically about Caucasian versus Asian skin. Okay, if you're making a formula for the Asian market, find actives with in vivo results in Asian skin. If you're formulating for Caucasian skin, the same rule applies. Find materials that show efficacy in Caucasian skin. Uh, also need to consider the different process that happens in the skin that causes age spots. Okay, so if you're formulating a product to specifically target age spots, look for suppliers with materials that show you in vivo results for age spots. The process is different. You can't apply a skin whitening product or active and expect it to have the same result on an age spot. It's a different process happening. 
Um, but again, one of the biggest issues with these products is over-promising to your consumer, and that can be in terms of what they can expect long-term. Also short-term, because the cells that are there need to come through, so when you actually stop these reactions from occurring, it's still gonna take a good four weeks for those new whiter cells to be visible to the consumer. And it's in that time that you could lose their loyalty if they don't see some sort of result from the product as well. So another way is to put some sort of instant benefits, soft focus um, or light whitening pigment so that they perceive results sooner because it is going to take about four weeks minimum, even, in a good, even with a good active, in a good base to get some visible results from the product. And again, one of the ways you can try and maximise the consumer loyalty over that period of time is to not overpromise in the first place. It can't happen in a couple of days. And like I say, having a day product and a night product where they've actually got some UV absorbers in the day product, they're also going to see faster results because they're going to be stopping the tanning reaction happening in the first place. And one of the other things I just want to point out before moving on from these products is the issues with claims. So while we can look at actives and raw material suppliers can talk to you here about how the material works on a cellular level, you can't put that into your marketing. So visibly lightens, okay? You talk about those results. Give consumers results, time frames, percentage, visibly lightens the skin by 20% in 36 days, something like that. That's a claim you can make. I'm gonna have a little bit more of a look at that in a moment with some examples. It's really important um, that you understand the difference between performance and marketing. And those of you in marketing would know when you speak with your chemists, you might find yourself saying, don't just give me a product that works, give me something I can say about it. Because even if you have the best product in the world, if you can't create enough of a marketing sensation to be heard in the marketplace, you won't sell a single unit. So you need to have both. You need to have a product that works, but you need to have a fantastic and clever story that's compliant that will stand out against your competition. And definitely with these products, whitening, anti-pollution sunscreens, there's a lot of competition. So what are you gonna do that makes it different? not just in performance, but also in getting some attention in the marketplace because it's already crowded. Okay, let's have a look at some of the key issues with anti-pollution products. The biggest issue you face is the competition. There is so much choice out there. So you need to diversify. You need to have additional benefits in the product. It's not enough to just have anti-pollution. You need to be making other claims as well. Um, and we are seeing uh, more and more launches come out with blue light protection now, with anti-pollution, possibly with UV protection. So think beyond just anti-pollution because it's not enough in today's crowded marketplace. Um, we're also seeing clean air acts come into place in different countries. Uh, and as the air gets cleaned up, your consumer loses the need Okay, when they can look at a smog-filled sky, they can visualise, what must this be doing to my skin? But as that air gets cleaner, and if you're trying to market an anti-pollution product to a country or an area where their air is reasonably clean, the consumer doesn't visually see the need. So you'd need another story. Um, the blue light story, of course, is fantastic. We spend so much time in front of computers uh, on our smartphones. So you, know, you need another angle to make sure that your consumer's feeling the need for the product, otherwise they're not gonna use it. And of course, a lot of your anti-pollution products where that's their only story are a lot of film forming products. So you don't need penetration with that type of product. So I'm using that as a comparison because of course with skin whitening actives, if you can't get good epidermal penetration, you won't get good efficacy. Compared to these products, if, it, if it's just anti-pollution, it's film forming, it's at the surface of the skin. So remember, you need to get your active where it needs to go. So if you're also creating a product for anti-pollution, uh, if, if you are using an active that only works on anti-pollution, you need to have other actives in there so that you can have other marketing claims. And then those actives need to get to their target delivery sites. Otherwise, they may as well not be present in the formula. 
Okay, sunscreens, the big issues. You need to get high performance plus good skin feel. So who's ever tried formulating a sunscreen? You're all very shy, because I'm betting there's more than no one who's ever tried to formulate a sunscreen. So we're dealing with tacky, sticky, gluggy substances. And as our consumer demands a really high SPF now, we need a lot more of these tacky, gluggy, sticky substances. So the trick is to put enough of those in there without impacting the performance. And the actual spread of your product is hugely important to achieve a good sunscreen. And again, you're dealing with tacky, gluggy, sticky substances, so you need to focus on that spread because if you can't get a good spread, a good even film, your SPF rating is lower no matter how much you chuck into that formula. Um, so I'm going to look at that in a moment. Some other issues, sprays and roll-ons. Well, the way we test a sunscreen is they actually put a large amount of product on a very small surface, and that's how they test the sunscreen and get a rating. The problem with this is when you provide a consumer a spray-on product or a roll-on product, they just don't put enough of it on. And then they go out in the sun and it's labelled SPF 50 plus, so they have a false sense of security. They get burnt and they wonder why. Um, a, you haven't put enough of it on. B, you've probably stayed out in the sun way longer than you should have because your product says SPF 50 plus and you somehow think you're protected for the entire day when it just doesn't work like that. Uh, and of course, if you don't have a good spread application and if it doesn't stay on the skin, you know, if they're sweating, if they're swimming, they're not protected anymore. So one of the big issues with sunscreens is to get them to feel good. And sprays and roll-ons really aren't the best solution because the consumer doesn't use enough of it. And unfortunately, they never think that. They just think, oh, this product didn't work. Okay, it was tested to the standard, but the way it was tested in the standard was not at all how that product got applied to them when they went out in the sun swimming, running, all the rest of it. So the performance and the skin feel very, very important there. Stability is another big issue with sunscreens. Okay, again, we're dealing with thick, tacky, gluggy substances, and we want to get two or three year shelf life from a product that sits in a beach bag and gets exposed to, you know, 40 degree temperature in that beach bag or the car. It can easily get to 50 degrees, and the stability is compromised. Not only that, we usually have a significant um, powder or oil phase that we need to stabilise in the formula. We need to keep homogeneous distribution of those actives, otherwise, again, the SPF rating plummets. Um, oxidation of the product, because again, they're usually used and kept in hot places. Um, and also, you've got to think about your UV absorbers that you're using and the lipids that you've got in the formula. So if you've got incompatibilities between the polar UV absorbers and your non-polar lipids, you start to get crystallisation. So if you've ever had crystallisation in a formula, that's probably why. So you haven't used a suitable solvent to help ensure those two materials mix and stay mixed throughout the shelf life. Regulatory limits are a big issue, especially if you're going into multiple countries. Now, I don't want to ruin anyone's day, but I'm going to tell you right now, it is impossible to have one label that's going to fit every country. Sorry about that. I'll save you the effort. You can go and scope all the different regulations around the world, or you can just listen to Belinda. Listen to Belinda. Save you several hours. It's impossible. You cannot have one label that's going to fit the world. And a lot of times, you're not going to have one formula that's going to suit every type of skin and humidity either. Okay, so if you're formulating a product for this region in particular, you need to really focus on that skin feel because it's already humid. Any product that's applied in this sort of humidity is going to feel heavier on the skin than if you go to a drier climate where we want more emolliency from our product. Okay, just bear that in mind as well. Um, water resistance is another issue when formulating these products because you need to get a nice even film on the skin for the best possible SPF rating. But when you use some of these polymers to provide water resistance, you can end up with that balling up. Anyone ever applied a product and you're rubbing it in and you can feel it actually balling up? Well, guess what your UV absorbers and filters are doing as well? 
they're all agglomerating and your SPF rating is going to be terrible. So that base is really important. And of course, there's so much competition in this area. What are you going to do that's different with your sunscreen? And let's face it, these products cost more to produce because of the materials you're using. They cost more because of the testing. They cost more because of the stability. They cost more because of the scale-up issues. What are you going to do that's so different in your product that's going to help you sell product in an already competitive and crowded marketplace? And of course, you need to make sure it performs well because your consumer probably won't apply it properly and then they'll blame the formula, not their application. Okay, so now that I've painted a really dismal picture with all the issues, let's talk about how we can fix some of these things. So the very first thing I want to talk about is efficacy versus marketing story. So what I have here is an example. If you look at the top right hand corner, that's fantastic information for a chemist. It's showing comparison of materials in vitro. That's doing nothing to sell the product in the marketplace. You can't use that information in a marketplace. Okay? Definitions of cosmetic is um, how it changes the appearance of the skin. You can't talk about physiological or cellular processes. You can't provide in vitro results. You need to provide in vivo visible differences. So again, when you're looking at materials out here on display and, and there's a lot of choice and there's a lot of fantastic materials, look for the efficacy in it, but also look for the marketing, okay? So the marketing people in the room, you're going to be looking for visible differences because that's what you can take to market. The chemists in the room, you might be looking at the in vitro comparisons, but always remember you need to look for good in vivo results that your marketing person can take out in the marketplace and sell, okay? Like I said, if you have the best formula in the world, if you can't get someone to see what it's gonna do for them fast, they're either not gonna buy it in the first place or they're not gonna keep using it long enough to get results. Okay, so you can put in some instant effects materials that's going to help with brand loyalty. Making sure that you use highly efficacious materials in the right amount is going to make sure the product works. But having some in vivo results, visibly lightens by X percent in 28 days, that's going to actually help sell the product. So chemists, when you're selecting materials, you might find you end up needing to select two materials. One that's got fantastic in vitro results, one that's got fantastic in vivo results. It's great when you can pick a material that has both, but that's what you need to be looking for. And again, I'll just remind her about ensuring your claims are compliant. Okay, we do see products come out in the marketplace. If a regulator catches you and you're doing the wrong thing, you'll need to remove it, no matter what your competitor is doing. You can't say to a regulator, oh, but that brand is saying the same thing. They'll say, well, report them and in the meantime, fix your claims. Okay, so they've all got to be visibly based. So make sure you have some visible based results to take to market. Uh, and as I mentioned before, make sure you can get your active to where it needs to be. Use a good delivery system. Um, so you can use osmolites to help get actives into deeper layers of the skin. You can use micro emulsions, fantastic delivery, liposomes, Actually, I've got a video coming out soon on how to create your own liposomes. Who watches my videos? Come on. Who watches my videos? Yeah, that's better. Okay, um, we do have a lot of free videos and um, we nearly have a 1,000 YouTube subscribers. I didn't even go out there with that in mind and then my assistant told me the other day, you've nearly got a 1,000 subscribers. I was like, yes. Okay, so we have heaps of free videos from our website. Um, and if you want to see a formulation solution, if you have a formulation problem you'd like a video on, please email me because I want to give you guys the videos you want to watch. I don't just do it just for fun. Well, it is fun. But I also want to give you guys the solutions that you're looking for. Okay, so another way to stand out, be multifunctional. So this is an example here uh, of an active that is an anti-pollution active primarily but it also has activity in deeper layers of the skin. So it doesn't just work against particulate matter at the surface of the skin, it also works deeper in the skin. Uh, another thing you wanna really look for is what can your consumer see? 
So here's another example, city stem by Sederma. Yes, it protects from PM 2.5. Um, yes, it removes and neutralises oxidative species. This is all good and well. But these aren't things that your consumer can visually determine is working for them. Okay, one of the ways to maximise efficacy in your products is to give your consumer something they can actually see or feel. All right? Not just something that's deeper in their skin that they might not see for, you know, one or two years' time or comparing a, a picture of their mother at 40 and them at 40 to know it's worked for them. They want something that they can see results from much better than that. Uh, so, for example, um, can I see stimulating the skin's natural antioxidants? I can't see that. Consumer can't see that. So it's great that you have, you know, um, supports natural antioxidants or contains antioxidants, but your consumer can't see that. Your consumer can see a reduction in pimples and blackheads. Okay? That's their ultimate purchasing decision. If they're looking for an anti-pollution product, uh, and then they, they can see a product on the shelf that's also talking about reduces pimples and blackheads and they've got acne prone skin or just congested skin from particulate matter, they're buying the product that talks about the pimples and the blackheads. Not only that, they can actually then see the products working for them. How else do you know that an anti-pollution product is working for you? You want to see a clearer complexion, right? But if you're promised all sorts of other things about you know, antioxidant or other protective effects of the formula, how can they tell if the product's working for them? It might be. It might be doing a fantastic job. But if they can't see something happening for their skin, they're going to have very low loyalty. They'll switch to another brand that promises them something they can see. Here's another example. I'm showing you examples of companies that do it well. Um, how much of this can you see? For example, 100% stop of UVA-induced photoaging. Can't really see that. But if I can suddenly see a reduction in wrinkles, I'm believing that message. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's not just about having fantastic efficacy, not just about getting the material to the site where it needs to be. It's about making sure your consumer's got something that they can see the product is working or feel that the product is working for them. That's how you get good brand loyalty. And that's how you maximise the efficacy from your formulas. You can be getting it to where it needs to be. It can be doing the job, but give your consumer something that they can really know that it's doing their job. Um, Long-term moisturisation, they can feel that. Improvement of skin roughness, they can see and feel that. Anti-inflammatory, they can see a reduction in redness. Like I talked about with the whitening products, having a UV absorber or UV protective effect in that product, even if you don't make claims about it, they're going to see very fast the difference in their skin from using a product with UV protection. Okay, they're then going to believe that the product is working for them much faster. And then it does take time for the new skin cells to come through. Um, you can see, age reduction. You can't see DNA protection and you can't make that claim either because that's a physiological or cellular process. But there's a lot there that you can see. There's a lot of in vivo results. Uh, another example. Again, photos are fantastic. Befores and afters, using people from your company, asking the supplier for permission to use their image. Um, these are fantastic because then your consumer can see the promise before they buy the product. Make sure it's obviously delivering. Um, in this case, again, anti-pollution, the story, all of these have been anti-pollution products. What makes them different? They do more than just anti-pollution. Um, in this case, skin purifying with oil control and pore reduction. You can see that. Your consumer has a marker. So therefore, they believe it's providing the anti-pollution. Now, I'm not saying the other anti-pollution materials aren't delivering on their promises. They probably are. But if your consumer has something much more visible to, to notice that that is happening, like pore reduction, they're believing the story a lot more. And you are enhancing the efficacy of that product by giving them something else to notice that it's really working and doing its job. Reduction in wrinkles, increase in skin hydration. This is suiting a lot of different skin types. 
some other tips to boost efficacy in general. Um, and these are some common errors that formulators make when they're selecting actives or putting their formulas together. pH compatibilities would be the number one thing that I see formulators do wrong. They might make a fantastic base product, might feel fantastic, then they get an active and they put it into the formula. The active needs a pH environment of around 4.5 to 5, for example, and they put in a product with a pH of 6 or 7. It's not going to work. This is the number one thing I see formulators get wrong. Um, another thing, emulsion stability. If that emulsion is not stable, you're no longer suspending oil or water droplets properly, depending whether you're making water and oil or oil and water, but you're also not suspending your active homogeneously. Now, if I'm not applying the right amount of active every time that product's getting applied, I'm not going to see results. So making sure you use the active at the in vivo clinical data amount is important. Putting it into a stable base is hugely important. Um, delivery, I've mentioned this a few times. Are you getting the active ingredient to where it needs to go to be effective? If you can't get a skin whitening active to the basal layers of the epidermis, you might as well not have it in there. Charge compatibilities. So do not use materials in an environment it's not compatible with. So if you're using an active that is not compatible in an anionic environment, don't use anionic emulsifiers. I've had this conversation with formulators and they say, oh, but I'm only using a little bit. Well, it's not compatible with that little bit. Don't put it in there. You've got so many choices. Just don't do it. Um, method, are you adding it at the right point? And I always say to people, um, particularly students, if you cannot find data to tell you whether a material is heat sensitive or not, treat it as if it is, okay? Because a lot of your actives need to be at a below 40 degrees. If you can't find information to tell you that it's heat tolerant, treat it as if it isn't. So I've got over here again another example, um, the dosage to use, uh, and then I've got optimum pH. That's the information you look for on the data sheets from your supplier. Because if I use that material in a pH of four or five, I should not expect it to perform the same way. Same as when you're looking at in vivo test results. If that product was used in a cream, say an oil and water emulsion applied twice daily at 2%, I need to use it in my oil and water emulsion applied twice daily at 2%. I talked before about having a day and night product. So both formulas then need to have 2% in the formula. The key difference between the day product, it would probably feel lighter to apply, and if it was a whitening product, I'd have some UV absorbers in there, so I'm getting, I'm stopping the actual alpha MSH in the first place, so I'm gonna stop the whole tanning process from the very start. Put in my whitening active to boost the whitening effectiveness of the product. Put in some soft focus materials so the consumer's getting an instant effect. That's my day product. Night product might have some of those soft focus materials, a little bit more emolliency, humectancy for night time, depending on the skin type I'm formulating for. But both formulas are going to be at a compatible pH for the active I've used, going to have the same active, and it's going to be used in both formulas at the amount that was used in the in vivo trials that proved efficacy and the same formulation type. Do not expect the same results from a gel that you get from an oil and water emulsion. Okay, it may or may not happen. Now, if that active needs to get to deeper layers of the skin, it might be relying on that microemulsion to help carry it through. So check, you've got to check these things. I'm not saying it can't happen, but just don't assume. Um, think about if any solvents are required for your active ingredients to ensure they're homogeneously distributed and make sure you're using the right amount. That's the in vivo clinically proven amount to get the best results. Um, remember that you need less than 500 Daltons to penetrate the skin. Your hydrophilic pathways are 0.4 nanometers. Intercornea site space, 20 to 75 nanometers. Stratum corneum thickness, by comparison, 10 to 40,000 nanometers. So we're talking about the blade of grass in a football field. You're going to get that blade of grass from one end of the football field to the other and you've got to get it through all the little pathways in the meantime. You need a really good delivery system, otherwise there's no point at even being in there. 
Um, delivery methods, liposomes, like I say, check out our free um, formulation videos from our website. We're going to have a liposome video coming out soon, how you can make your own liposomes. And I get excited with that because then you can use any of the materials you see out here, well, most of them, there's some conditions, um, and you can make your own liposome package. What a fantastic marketing story is that? Your unique liposome. You don't have to buy an active material already in a liposome. You can make your own liposomes. Look for that video coming soon. Um, use some penetration enhancers like osmolites or DMI. Um, you can stop or use less, there's supposed to be a slash there. Stop UV or less UV in the first place and you're going to have a very happy consumer. Even if your whitening isn't doing its job, if you're reducing the amount of UV exposure by the product they're applying regularly, they're still going to see good results. Okay. Anti-pollution. How can you boost efficacy specific for anti-pollution? Know what your competition is claiming. And this is a rapidly diversifying area. So I would also really strongly suggest you do it in a fast formulation technique because the products and the claims you see in the marketplace today are going to be quickly usurped by materials and products that come out in the market within a couple of months from now. So you need fast formulation concepts. You need good, um, good stability bases. You can plonk some extra actives into to have a competitive marketing story. This is a very rapidly evolving sector of the market. Uh, as I mentioned, blue light is one of the areas where we're seeing it evolve quite rapidly. Make sure you're using multifunctional actives or secondary actives so it's not just protection from particulate matter. That's not enough. Um, think about companion products. SPF protection, cleansers, detox masks, antioxidant. These are all just ideas. See what will fit in your product range. Um, and then I just had a bit of an idea I wanted to show you or share with you. Imagine if you had a product that was anti-pollution, anti-blue light, and a whitening foundation with SPF. You could potentially do it. It might blow your budget a little if you're, if you're making really economy-based products. But think about how you can do it. Okay, and you're giving your consumer what they're really looking for. Boosting efficacy with sunscreens. As I've mentioned, spread is crucial. And what I've done with these images here is I have the same amount of arrows representing incident UV light, and I have the same number of little circles or shapes in each image. A lot of people don't realise that. So that, you look at those first two top images, same number of arrows, same number of circles. Can you see how a poor formulation, a poor film, agglomeration of UV absorbers or particles, and a lot of UV light is getting through? You compare that with the image on the top right, and when you're formulating a good stable product, you're holding your absorbers or particulates homogeneously throughout the film. You've got a nice even spread on the skin. Look how much UV you're stopping then. So what I'm demonstrating with these images here is same amount of UV absorber in both cases, it's the film that matters. A good spread, homogeneous distribution, and you're going to maximise the SPF result from your formula. Can everyone see that? I hope that makes sense because it's so important. It's not just a matter of putting more and more SPF into your product. It's a matter of making sure it spreads well, it holds the uh, absorbers or particles homogeneously, you get that thin film on the skin and by using good, um, good spreading agents you can improve the sensory and that's an important aspect too. And of course down the bottom I've just shown like using different combinations uh, and you can also get some synergistic effects from using combinations of UV absorbers but the actual base product is so important. So I've just summarised some of that here in this slide. If you want a copy of this presentation, just email me and I can send it to you happily. And we've also got some extra videos on sunscreens on our website. Um, so high spreading lipids in combination with the low spreading sunscreens. These are tacky and gluggy. You need to put in some high spreading lipids to help spread the product over the skin evenly. Look at your emulsion base, that's incredibly important. And hopefully from the pictures I just had on the screen, you can visualise in your mind why that emulsion base is so important. Use dispersions for powders. You'll get a much higher SPF result 
better skin feel and less of that whitening gluggy look on your skin if you use a dispersion for your powder. Combinations often lead to synergies, but be careful of patents, speak with your supplier. When you're formulating a sunscreen, it's really important that you choose your sunscreen materials first because the types and amounts that you choose, you'll then need to determine the right lipids to improve that spread and skin feel. And that is going to determine whether you're making water and oil or oil and water. So for the uh, concept developers, marketing people in the room, when you go to your chemist and you say, I want to create this really light oil and water SPF 50 plus product, that's why your chemist starts laughing. Okay, because it's not up to us to just go, oh, well, today I feel like making a really light skin feel SPF 50. It doesn't work like that. We need to use the right combination of UV absorbers in the right amount and everything going right to achieve SPF 50. We need to use light skin feel spreading lipids in there and we usually then instantly come out at 30 to 50% lipid or lipid soluble content. And that instantly means we're then creating a water and oil emulsion. So it's not an easy thing to create and it's not easy to create that light skin feel. But when we're selecting our materials, this is why we actually need to select the UV absorbers first, make them spread better, and then that usually determines the type of emulsion we're creating. It's not like every other product where you can dictate, I want water and oil or I want oil and water. With sunscreens, that's usually not the case because the materials we have to use and the quantities we're using usually dictates that for us. And you do tend to get a better water resistance by creating water and oil anyway. Um, SPF boosters are an option, but having a good base is far more effective than any SPF booster. Again, I'm going to save you hours and hours of trying. Just take my word for it. You have a good base. You can still put an SPF booster in there, but if you don't have a good base to begin with, you're already fighting an uphill battle. Okay, well, I hope you learnt lots in 40 minutes. And if you learnt lots from 40 minutes, imagine what you can learn from me in a year. Um, our training is all online and we send it to you. We have lots of free videos, as I've mentioned, on the website. So if you didn't get enough of me today, you can go online and watch more and more of me. And it doesn't stop there. You can see me in the formulation lab tomorrow at 4.15. I'm going to be taking you through formulation solutions for sensory and polymers. Um, in the lab on Thursday at 2.30, I'm going to be solving your formulation problems with emulsifiers and selecting emulsifiers. And on Thursday at 12 o'clock here in the marketing theatre, I'm also going to be walking you through how to formulate with essential oils. So I hope to see you again in the lab or here. If you do have any questions, please come and see me outside. If you do want a copy of the presentation, please leave me with your card or email me and I can send you a copy as well. I hope you got a lot out of that today. It was a lot to cover in 40 minutes, but hopefully some good ideas.